Okay, we are now resuming with Group 7, Section 16AA Licences Review. I call Amendment 76 in the name of Emma Harper, grouped with Amendments uh, 78 and 80. Emma Harper to move Amendment 76 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, uh, as discussed during Stage 2, the need for monitoring and reporting must be balanced with the resources available to the Scottish Government and other stakeholders. And in response to the Stage 1 report, and the, the then Lead Minister for the Bill, Julie Martin, emphasised that the Government's commitment to additional reporting where beneficial was welcomed by me. And amendments 76, 78 and 80 require the monitoring of Section 16AA licences and their impact. And one of the key objectives of the Bill is to tackle raptor persecution on grouse shooting estates through the implementation of Section 16AA licence and provisions. The Weritor Review highlighted the significant impact of criminal activities on certain grouse moors on three raptor species populations, the Golden Eagle, the Hen Harrier and the Peregrine Falcon. And indeed, there have been criminal investigations even recently into the missing female uh, Golden Eagle called Merrick in part of my South Scotland region. The Merlin has also been identified as being impacted by increased rotational burning, and as a significant proportion of the Merlin population nests on moorland, they may be affected by the land management activities covered in the Bill. Therefore, regular monitoring is essential to assess the Bill's effectiveness in curb curbing such persecution. And considering the evidence that has been presented throughout the passage of this Bill through Parliament, I strongly believe that the requirement to undertake raptor population assessments is important. So therefore, I move Amendment 76. Thank you. I now call Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Amendment 76 in the name of Emma Harper is well intentioned, but the, word, the wording is a matter for concern. The intention to assess the effectiveness of Section 16 AA licences is not something I disagree with, but to do so on the premise of the conservation status of certain raptors is a matter that I find concerning. The reason I say this is because we have heard evidence on this bill that a diversity of factors, including food availability, habitat favourability, disease, conditions and disturbance, all have a bearing on the conservation status of certain raptors. A broad brush assessment of conservation status is therefore not an assessment of all the effectiveness of section six of the effectiveness of the section sixty six sixteen AA license. Uh, so there should be a forensic interpretation uh, of the data before such conclusions are drawn. So given the open endedness of the wording in this amendment, I do not think it's an amendment which should be supported. Thank you, Mr. Carson, and I call on the Minister. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And could I just put on record my sincere thanks to the Presiding Officer for taking that last five minute break? It was very much needed. Um, President Officer, tackling raptor persecution is one of the central aims of this bill, and I agree with Emma Harper that in order to assess the bill's effectiveness, it will be necessary to conduct monitoring and surveillance of the species that we are aiming to protect. Her amendment, which provides for reasonable and proportionate reporting, will help to ensure that Scottish ministers will be able to assess the effectiveness of the licensing scheme on certain raptor populations. I will therefore be supporting this amendment, and I would encourage all members to do the same. Thank you. And I call on Emma Harper to wind up. Press of withdrawal, Amendment uh, 76. Thank you, President Officer. I, I think it is absolutely necessary that we monitor what is happening with our raptor uh, species in uh, rural areas, and I know that members across chamber will agree that raptor persecution is despicable, and it is an act that is carried out for very few people. So, as the, this bill proposes to support the fact that most wildlife management is conducted lawfully and contributes so much to the rural economy, I am pleased that the minister is supporting this amendment, and I encourage, encourage other colleagues to do so. Thank you. The question is, Amendment 76 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now.
And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 76 in the name of Emma Harper is yes, 78, no, 29. There were no abstentions. That amendment is therefore uh, agreed. I call Amendment 77 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 61. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 78 in the name of Emma Harper, already debated with Amendment 76. Emma Harper to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 78 in the name of Emma Harper is yes 83, no 30. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Uh, call Amendment 79 in the name of Colin Smith already debated with Amendment 61. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not moved. That is not moved. The question is that Amendment 80 in the name of Emma Harper already debated. Yeah. Call Amendment uh, 80 in the name of Emma Harper already debated with Amendment 76. Emma Harper to move or not move? Moved, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 80 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. Uh, there will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 80 in the name of Emma Harper is yes 84, no 30. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. We now move to Group 8, Animal Welfare Inspectors Powers. I call Amendment uh, 81 in the name of Edward Mountain, grouped with Amendments 82 and 17. Edward Mountain to move Amendment 81 and speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And, uh, I'm not going to do what I normally do, which is start by opening on my amendment. I'm going to start by saying that I'd much rather my amendment wasn't there and Amendment 82 was the one that was approved. Uh, and as I don't think that's likely, I'm going to push my amendment, 81, and I would say that if, if either 81 or 82 fail, then I think Amendment 17 in the name of Rhoda Grant is, is an amendment that I would be happy to support. Uh, Ms Grant doesn't look surprised, uh, nor should she be, because it's a sensible and reasonable amendment. My amendment is such uh, to try, is to say that those people who are appointed inspectors should do a course. 
Minister. I'm sure you'll support that. You make keepers do courses, even if they've been doing it all their life, and you, and you make other people do courses. So my, my point is that an animal inspector who is drafted in as a result of this legislation should do a course. The government could set the course they want to do, they, the course content that they want, but they should do a course. I'd be highly surprised if a minister would vote against this, having spoken so eloquently about why courses are required from everyone else. But, presiding officer, I'll listen to hear how they can. Thank you. Are you and moving I'm, the amendment in my name Thank you. Uh, during the speech. I, Thank you. I reiterate it. Presiding. Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 82 and other amendments in the group. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. I have to say that I and my colleagues in the Scottish Conservatives find Section 8A of the bill extremely disconcerting. We argue that evidence-based policies making is the duty of government, and particularly so when you're dealing with issues of power trust and enforcing the law. The Scottish Government commissioned an independent task force to examine whether the Scottish S SPCA, a charitable organisation, should be afforded enhanced powers with respect to wildlife crime. And the outcome of that, that review could not be more clear, and I quote, it is evident that without the full institutional support of the Crown Office, Police Scotland and the National Wildlife Crime Unit, an extension of powers, whatever the scope of those might be, to the SSPCA would be fraught. Such institutional support is not readily forthcoming, due particularly to concerns over primacy of responsibility, access to intelligence or interface with other cases and health and safety risks to personnel. Enhanced partnership working is therefore the recommended course of action. It is absolutely astonishing that ministers have ploughed on and extended powers to the SSPCA in spite of the outcome of that review, and it is testament to the complete disdain this government has for the considered opinion of experts they themselves commissioned, most likely at significant cost to the taxpayer. In addition to this, we heard in evidence that there is a complete deficit of trust and confidence on the part of land managers when it comes to the SSPCA. Ross Ewing of SLE told us in evidence that a recent survey of 129 land managers found that 97 per cent did not have confidence in the ability of the SSPCA to investigate wildlife crime in an unbiased and impartial way. With the extended investigatory powers in this bill, the SSPCA would oversee evidence gathering in relation to potential offences. I do not see how any such evidence gathering can be deemed independent with their clear and strong opposition to game shooting. The SSPCA is a non-neutral, non-statutory charity which would have a vested interest in the outcome of such investigations. And as a relevant example, the Post Office Horizon scandal highlights the risks of injustice that can be created when we give investigatory powers, including involvement in evidence gathering and disclosure, to a party that is not independent of the subject matter. These powers should be reserved for the Scottish Police and the Crown Office to ensure procedural fairness. This view is also shared by the Law Society of Scotland, who, in relation to the SSPCA, and I quote, would not generally consider it appropriate that wider criminal investigatory powers would be extended to it, particularly given its role and function as a registered charity. Amendment 82 in my name will remove Section 8A in light of what we've just heard and the Scottish Government's disregard of the very review it commissioned to examine this question, the clear lack of institutional support from key statutory agencies and the deficit of trust and confidence on the part of land managers. In the event that my amendment should fail, or that of my colleague Edward Mountain, I would strongly recommend members to vote for Amendment 17 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which will ensure a review of said powers takes place within five years. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Rhoda Grant to speak to Amendment 17 and other amendments in the group. Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 17 allows for a review of the SSPCA powers. I have several concerns regarding the powers being given to the SSPCA under this bill. I hear clearly of the frustration felt by SSPCA officers called out due to animal welfare concerns and seeing illegal activity and they can't record it or even intervene on it. Police Scotland doesn't have the resources to police wildlife crime to any extent, let alone to the extent of providing a deterrent. However, there are concerns about empowering a third sector organisation to provide law enforcement and these concerns 
relate to setting a precedent that allows a third sector organisation to carry out police investigations, concerns about training, governance, independence, resources, both financially and physically, and staffing. Amendment 82 looks to leave out section A to A, um, reflecting some concerns that members had. Therefore, I believe my amendment tries to find some middle ground. I listened to the Minister at stage two when he suggested one year would not be long enough to review the process. Therefore, my amendment ensures that those powers be reviewed after five years and that the findings of that review would be laid before the Scottish Parliament. This will give the, the Scottish Government the opportunity to review the extent that these powers are being used, whether the courts accept the standard of evidence provided and whether they should continue. Edward Mountain's Amendment 81 asks the Scottish Ministers that asks that the Scottish ministers must regulate regarding, re, regarding training of officers so impaired. And I'm unsure that's wise because sh unwise, because surely it should be the police that train the officers in evidence gathering and techniques. And that will change from time to time. So having to regulate at every turn would be counterproductive for these officers. That should be left to the police to do to ensure their skills are up to date. Thank you. And I call Mark Roskell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I warmly welcome the inclusion of new powers for the SSPCA to help tackle wildlife crime in this bill? And I'd like to thank those who've been working on this and building up the evidence base over the last 13 years. Many of those people are here tonight joining us in the public gallery. And I think it's testament to them that this case has been won through and is now in legislation. During those 13 years, we have seen disgraceful wildlife crimes go unpunished in Scotland. And the reason why they've gone uh, unpunished is because of the inability of the police to gather evidence to secure successful prosecutions. Now, with welfare inspectors, they have had their hands tied when called to the scene of wildlife crimes. And I'm sure many members will be familiar of cases where the inspectors are called to a live animal court, for example, in an illegal trap, only to then find themselves unable to gather evidence of other illegally set traps nearby. Often, given that such crimes occur in remote areas, this evidence has disappeared by the time Police Scotland officers can reach the scene, sometimes days later. SSP officers have an important role to play in ensuring evidence of wildlife crime can be included in, a, in an official police investigation and potential prosecution. Now, I've been calling for an extension to the SSPCA powers now for a number of years, and I called in the last session of Parliament for a government task force to review the existing powers. Upon entering government, uh, Green MSPs ensured that the task force would report back in time to allow its recommendations to be taken forward in this legislation. And that's exactly what this legislation does. It sets up a proportionate way forward on SSPCA powers, not replicating the work of the police, but enhancing the work of the police. The SSPCA does a fantastic job at present, but this extension of powers enables them to fill the gap in the existing law, aiding the police in their investigation of wildlife crime offences. And I would say to members opposite, you know, if they're in any doubt about the professionalism the absolute professionalism of the SSPCA. I would urge them to go out with an SSPCA inspector, see them at work, see how they discharge their responsibilities. And if they do that, you will see that these powers are proportionate and the SSPCA is a professional body. And I look forward to them discharging these new powers in Scotland. And I would urge all members to reject every amendment in this group. And I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> Before I directly address each of the amendments in this group, I'd like to make two points about the decision to extend the powers of the Scottish SPCA inspectors to investigate specified wildlife crimes. Firstly, as Mark Russell said, this is not a new issue. It's something the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament has been considering and debating for over a decade. 
It was first proposed that the Scottish SPCA be given new powers to tackle wildlife crime during the parliamentary discussion on the Wildlife and Natural Environment Bill in 2011. Then, during the, passage of the anim during the passage of the Animal and Wildlife Penalties, Protections and Powers Bill in the last Parliament, the then Minister for Rural Affairs and Natural Environment, Mary Goujon, announced the formation of a task force to consider the role of the SSPCA in relation to the investigation of wildlife crime. My second point is in regard to the appropriateness of these powers. The SSPCA is one of over 50 agencies, other than Police Scotland, who report cases to the Crown Office each year as a specialist reporting agency. They already have the power to both investigate any animal welfare case and to submit those cases directly to the Crown Office. They do it every day, and that includes the investigation of unnecessary, unnecessary suffering against wild animals. I'll say that again. I'll come back to you. I'll say that again. The Scottish SPCA already investigate wildlife crime in cases where the wild animal is found alive. That could be cases like badger baiting or hen harriers caught in spring traps. And I'll take your intervention. Uh, through the chair, please, Minister. Rachel Thanks, Hamilton. Thanks, the Minister, for taking uh, the intervention. But Police Scotland has objected to these powers and cited that there could be potential for cr wildlife crime investigations to be compromised. Um, I'd, also, I'd, I'd like him to com comment on that, but also that Mark Ruskell said that the extension of the SSPCA powers be was because of the SNP Green Coalition in the Butte House Agreement. Is that true? Minister. The additional powers in the bill just mean that when authorised inspectors are investigating those cases where they already have the power to investigate, they can collect evidence in relation to other wildlife crime offences. For example, if they are responding to a live hen harrier that has been caught in a spring trap, they would also be able to pick up the illegal trap sitting next to it. That is something that they could not do before. With these powers, what these powers are not doing, however, is letting them respond to any new offences offences that they could not already respond to. And it's not about allowing them to take on more cases. It's just about allowing them to collect more evidence when they're doing what they already do. Yes, I will. Uh, Finlay Carson. I appreciate the Minister taking in French. And can I first put it on record my respect I have for, for Mike Flynn and, and the other uh, members of the SSPC and, and the, the work they do uh, in preventing cruelty to animals. But does the Minister think... Does the Minister think it's appropriate for the SSPCA to express their personal opinions on issues like Muirburn, which I believe they have done today in an interview with ITV Border, which is certainly not impartial. So should the public not expect a higher degree, and the Minister indeed, a higher degree of impartiality given their future potential role? Minister. I, I can't comment on something that I haven't seen, but in terms of what the, the, the relationship, that, and I apologise I didn't answer Rachel Hamilton's question, in, t in relation to the relationship between the police and the SSPCA, I will come to it. Amendment 81 would require that a Scottish, a, an SSPCA inspector using these extra powers must be trained before being authorised to do so. It also includes an enabling power to make regulations relating to approved training courses. This amendment is unnecessary, as I have just said. Scott, SSPCA inspectors have been effectively carrying out their existing functions under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 without a specific requirement for them to undergo training being set out in primary legislation. As a specialist reporting agency, the SSPCA already has to follow Crown Office Guide for Specialist Reporting Agencies and the Disclosure of Evidence Guidance. These guides provide important safeguards and training around how evidence is collected, corroboration, timeliness of submission to, of a case to the Crown Office, and care over the identification of individuals identified in cases as the perpetrator. Any additional training that may be required to undertake the additional functions will be set out in the Police Scotland SSPCA working protocol that will be developed prior to the provisions coming into force. For these reasons, I cannot support Amendment 81, and I encourage members to vote against it. The effect of Amendment 82 is that no additional powers will be confirmed on the SSPC inspectors under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006. These powers were voted into the Bill at Stage 2 and have been widely supported. The 2023 consultation received over 5,000 responses, and 71 per cent of those respondents agreed with these proposals. I cannot therefore support Amendment 82, and I would encourage members to vote against that. Amendment 17 creates a new requirement to review the SSPCA powers after five years. I understand where Ms Grant is coming from, and I agree with the need to review these provisions. However, I do not, I do not believe that the review requirement as, as proposed by Ms Grant is necessary. 
With regards to reporting on offence and prosecutions, there is already a statutory review requirement in section 26B of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 for Scottish Ministers to lay a report before Parliament on the annual incidents and prosecution of wildlife offences. We do this every year. It's called the Wildlife Crime in Scotland Annual Report, and it includes a section dedicated to the Scottish SBCA's investigation of wildlife crime. And it is broken down by wildlife crime priority areas, how many cases are reported to the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service, and how many are solely investigated by the SSPCA, and how many are led by Police Scotland. Amendment 17 will require a duplication of that effort every five years. With regards to a wider review in the operation of the Scottish SPCA powers, Eleanor Whittam has lodged an amendment that, to require a review of the operation and effectiveness of the bill, which includes the extension of the SSPCA powers. I therefore believe, and I hope that Ms Grant agrees with me, that between the existing statutory review and the one proposed by Ms Whittam, that Amendment 17 is unnecessary. I would therefore ask her not to press her amendment, and if it is pressed, I would encourage members to vote against it. Thank you. I now call on uh, Edward Mountain to uh, wind up press the withdraw amendment 81. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I have uh, been interested in listening to, to, to this debate. Uh, I, I would just say to Mr Ruskell, who made comments about whether we on, the, on this side of the chamber believe the SSPCA do a good job or not, I have no doubt they do a good job. I see them at the mart and I see them looking at farmers and I absolutely have respect with the way they go about their duty. And I have respect with the way they do it in a gentle approach in most cases, in a non-accusatory role, in a role of trying to find a solution. This is not what they're being asked to do here. This is a very, very different circumstance, and you're putting them on the, on the front line. And, and, and therefore, I think it is dangerous, and I think it could bring them into conflict. Uh, what I would say, is, am I surprised that the Minister doesn't believe they need to go on a course? Not really. Everyone else has to, but not them, because they're already trained. The fact that, the fact that uh, keepers and land managers have been on courses uh, seems to matter now. I, I'll be interested, and I'm just going to remind the, the members of my register of interest that I'm part of a family farming partnership. I suspect... Sorry, I, uh, Mr. Stewart. Off, sorry, I couldn't hear. Could you Mr. Stewart, could we not have the, the interventions from a certain position? Mr. Mountain, could you continue, please? I, I, I mentioned that because for two reasons. One is I suspect on the new agricultural bill, I'm going to be sent to do continual professional development on how to be a farmer, uh, having been doing it for 40 years. Uh, maybe not, but maybe I am. But I'll have to do a course, but the people who are being appointed inspectors won't. And as far as the Minister's comments, in relation to Rhoda Grant's uh, request. I think it's a reasonable request to do it once every five years, not a great difficulty. Let, let, let's get on and be reasonable. Let's get them doing courses. Let them, let's get us a report on what's going on. Thank you. I move the amendment in my name, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 81 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Alec Rowley. Thanks, President Officer. I already voted no. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I'll make sure that is recorded.
And the result of the vote on amendment number 81 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 33, no, 78. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 82 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with amendment 81. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Move. I think the question is that amendment 82 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division of members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Alec Rowley, point of order. They voted no. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I'll make sure that vote is recorded. Point of order, Craig Hoy. So I thank you, to Deputy President Officer. My app's playing up. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Hoy. I'll make sure that is recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 82 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 30, no, 79. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not uh, agreed. I call amendment 17 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with amendment 81. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Not moved. Moved. Uh, we therefore move to uh, Group 9, uh, Muirburn Requirement for Licence and Purposes. I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Minister. Group with Amendments 83, 19, 84, 85, 20, 102 and 108. Uh, Minister, to move Amendment 18 and speak to all amendments in the Group. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I will speak to my amendments in the group first and listen to what the other members say on their amendments before I respond. Now, we have heard throughout the progression of this bill the importance of Muirburn practitioners going through training to ensure they are conducting Muirburn in line with best practice. Amendment 18 clarifies the fence for those taking part in such training. It makes clear that a person making Muirburn during a training course does not commit an offence so long as the land is subject to a Muirburn licence, and I encourage members to support it. Amendment 19 adds a purpose to the list of purposes for which Muirburn on non-peatlands may be made. Throughout the course of this Bill's passage through Parliament, we have heard extensively about the dangers of wildfire, how devastating it can be to people and communities, to protect the species and to the wider environment that we are trying to protect. I have heard firsthand the accounts of gamekeepers who, through their management of the land, work to prevent wildfire and who often risk their life when one breaks out. And I would like to place on record my grateful thanks for them for doing so. The Bill has always included provisions to allow a Muirburn licence anywhere for the purpose of preventing wildfires, but at stage two there were some very useful discussions about why it would be helpful to have a provision on this stated explicitly in the face of the Bill. I want Muirburn practitioners to be under no doubt that the Scottish Government understands that when undertaken appropriately with caution and planning, Muirburn is a useful tool to prevent and reduce the risk of wildfire. And my Amendment 19 will also aid in understanding to what extent Muirburn is used to prevent and mitigate wildfire, as we will be able to collect data on how the number and location of licence issued for this purpose. So for these reasons, I encourage members to support Amendment 19. I move Amendment 18. Thank you, Minister. Uh, and I now call on Edward Mountain to speak to Amendment 83 and other amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I do just want to uh, 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 remind people what I just said about my register of interest, because uh, as an interest as a farmer, which manages, I manage grassland and heathland, it's relevant in this section, because I'm seeking to make a split between mule burn and burning of heath which is, in my mind, 
totally different. Uh, I would remind uh, members, if they want to just have a look, that uh, the definition of mule burn is uh, intentional and controlled burning of moorland vegetation to encourage new growth, either heather or grassland, for the management of moorland game and wildlife, or for the improving the grazing potential of moorland for livestock or deer. So, what I'm trying to do in these amendments is to take heath out of this, because there will be some areas of heath that are burnt. Those of you that have travelled from Edinburgh uh, to Perth have seen on the right, about halfway between two, there's that big area of broom and gorse that's been burnt. Uh, and that's quite natural to try and remove it, because it's very difficult to spread. And even if you cut it, it will then come back. So burning offers a valuable tool. So what I've tried to do in these amendments, 83, and a, uh, is to split the difference between mule burn, meaning heather, uh, from heath, which is scrub, which means it's not grown necessarily on acidic soils. I think there's a huge damage within this bill for overreach. Uh, I've not yet heard a definition which may uh, convince me as a farmer that I wouldn't end up being able to burn areas, say, of... Uh, grassland, which may be damaged by leather jacket uh, and, and be killed off, eaten off, and the only reasonable way to deal with that rather than spray it, which is, is pretty invasive and unhelpful, is to burn it and then reseed patches of it. This bill could make that impossible, and that slightly concerns me with that. Uh, I think we should also, Amendment 84, acknowledge that Muirburn is not just about improving land uh, for game, it's improving land for wildlife as well. And, and game can produce uh, more wildlife, I, and, and we all know that eagles predate on hares and, and peregrines predate on grouse, and therefore increasing stocks of both are good for our predators. Therefore, we shouldn't be frightened about allowing burning. Uh, I support the amendments uh, of Mr um, Fairley, sorry, Amendment 18, about defining who can burn, but I think uh, Amendment 19 uh, is, it needs to go further to include wildlife and game. And I think 80, Amendments 85 uh, seems common sense, um, and I'm unclear about Amendment 20, but I listen to, wait to hear that. So this is a chance, a one-off chance, to make sure that this doesn't overreach from heather into lowland farm management when it comes to, to burning. Presiding officer. Thank you. Um, I now call Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 85 and other amendments in the group. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also put on record my thanks to land managers and gamekeepers uh, for putting their lives on the line to help the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in the events of wildfires such as uh, Canic that we saw last year? which would have been much more devastating if they hadn't uh, put their lives on the line and used their experience. The Minister will be aware that there have been some concerns raised over inconsistency with respect to licensable purposes for Muirburn in the Bill. I'm pleased to see the Minister bring forward Amendment 19, which addresses one of the issues highlighted by stakeholders in respect of ensuring that preventing or reducing the risk of wildfire on non-peatland habitats is a standalone licensable purpose as it is for peatland habits, notwithstanding Edward Mountain's comments about this amendment. I also support my colleague Edward Mountain's practical amendments 83 and 84. And moving to amendment 85 in my name, which seeks to address inconsistency across licensable purposes, which I feel needs rectified. In its current form, the bill enables the making of Muirburn on peatland to restore the natural environment. This is at odds with a similar but broader, broader licensable purpose for non-peatland habitats, which enables Muirburn to be made to conserve, restore, enhance and manage the natural environment. Minister, ministers have not provided any substantive rationale for differentiating in this way, and I'm advised that there is a considerable body of scientific evidence which suggests Muirburn does have conservative, restorative and environmental enhancement. Um, but looking at the example that we got from Dr Andreas Heinmeier, um, the Peatland ES UK study, 
Um, we heard from him and a number of cross-party colleagues in an, an event recently in the Parliament, and that study suggests that Muirburn plays a role in retaining and enhancing the wetness of peatland habitats by reducing the extent to which evapotranspiration takes place, which is a combination of evaporation and transpiration. Similarly, it purports that Muirburn can be conservative and restorative by reducing the extent to which methane is produced, while simultaneously locking up more carbon and providing more nutrients. Given the long-term and rigorous nature of this research, I do, do not think that ministers can credibly say that Muirburn does not have those properties, particularly the conservation properties, the restorative properties and the enhancement value for peatland. Um, and for that reason, I hope that mem members across the chamber will be minded to support my amendment 85 in my name. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Rhoda Grant to speak to amendment 20 and other amendments in the group. Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My amendment 20 seeks to put in place a super affirmative process for laying regulations to modify the purposes for Muirburn under section 10.5. It will ensure that any regulations that modify the lists of purposes for Muirburn are subject to fuller consultation and scrutiny by a committee of this parliament. It was clear when we took evidence that the science around Muirburn is not clear. Well-managed peatland can tolerate Muirburn without any harm to the peat. However, degraded peatland can be damaged badly. And it's clear that wildfires were devastating to both peat and the natural environment while releasing a large amount of carbon into the atmosphere. And we saw that in Cannich recently. When a fuel load is left in the moors, the risk of wildfire is raised and climate change also creates that risk of wildfire. We need to monitor the use of muir burn going forward as a tool but also as a risk, and therefore we need to be able to modify the purposes for which it can be used. That said, such changes need consultation and scrutiny, and that's what my amendment 20 seeks to provide for. I lodged a similar amendment at stage two, but listened carefully to what the minister said about the time proposed and 120 days being too long in his estimation. This amendment, therefore, has changed the period in which the regulations are laid to 60 days, half of that previously asked for, and I hope this will now meet with government approval. Thank you. I invite the Minister to wind up. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, amendments 83, 102 and 105 change the definition of land for Muirburn from Moorland and Heath to just Moorland. The definition of Muirburn in this bill has been taken from the 1946 Hill Farming Act and this definition has been fit for purpose for nearly 80 years. Changing the definition of Muirburn to remove Heath is completely unnecessary I would and would remove Heathland from any of the bill's provisions, including the requirement for training. So therefore, I would encourage members to vote against this amendment. Edward Mountain's Amendment 84 to allow Muirburn to be undertaken in peatland to manage habitats for game birds and other wildlife does not take into account the value of Scotland's peatland. This amendment was lodged at stage two and was voted against then for good reason. As I set out at stage two, stage two, the purposes currently listed in the bill for undertaking Muirburn on peatland are limited in recognition of the risk of serious and significant carbon emissions when burning either damages the peat or interferes with the natural carbon sequestration process that occurs on functioning peatland. The bill seeks to balance the potential damage to peatland from Muirburn carried out incorrectly against the damage to peatland that may result from wildfires. That means that the process of undertaking any muir burn on peatland needs to be much more thoughtful and only to be undertaken in limited circumstances. I believe that allowing muir burn on peatland to manage habitats for game birds and other wildlife cannot be justified against the risk of damage to that peatland. I would encourage members to vote against Amendment 84 on this basis. Amendment 89 adds the terms conserving and enhancing the natural environment to the purposes for muir burn on peatland. The current provision allows for just restoring the natural environment. As I explained when speaking about Edward Mountain's amendments, the provisions for Muirburn and Peatland are about reaching a balanced position. The increased purposes for undertaking Muirburn proposed by Amendment 85 are broader terms than just restoring and therefore will open the scope of when Muirburn can take place on Peatland. For example, conserving the natural environment may allow Muirburn and Peatland to conserve it as moorland for the benefit of game birds. 
I think we can all agree that that would not be appropriate. It would put the wheat and peatlands at unnecessary risk, and it would not allow a line with our commitments to address the climate change. Our peatlands have suffered decades of poor management and are a precious resource in our fight against climate change, and I would encourage members to vote against Amendment 58 on that basis. And I would point out at this stage, President Officer, we have 2 million hectares of peatland in Scotland, and it is estimated that 75 per cent of it is degraded. Amendment 20 is unnecessary, as I have previously mentioned today when similar amendment was brought forward at stage two. There are established procedures in place for laying affirmative Scottish statutory instruments, which include laying the Scottish statutory instrument in draft before Parliament for normally the 54 days. This will give Parliament the opportunity to consider the draft instrument and take the evidence and vote on it. It is the correct, correct procedure for any such amending instruments, and both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee agreed with this approach in their Stage 1 reports. In addition, the Bill already contains a requirement to consult before making regulations to change the purposes for which Muirburn may be carried out under licence. Adding a further requirement, as described in the Rhoda Grant's amendment, would substantially delay the making of regulations needed to introduce urgent further protections for peatland, Muirburn or similar. I would encourage members to vote against Amendment 20 on that basis. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 83 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 18. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved, Presiding Officer. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote's closed. Uh, point of order, Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. My app didn't connect. I would have voted no. I'll make sure that vote is recorded. Point of order, Keith Brown. Can we have oh, thank you. Sorry, point of order, Keith Brown. Apologies, my app wouldn't refresh. I would have voted no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My app wouldn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms. Adamson. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 83 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes 30, no 82. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 19 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 18, Minister, uh, to move formally. Move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call amendment 84 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with amendment 18. Edward Mountain, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amend Amendment 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Claire Adamson. Uh, sorry, presenting officer, I had trouble with my app disconnecting again. I would have voted no. Uh, I, can, I can tell you, Ms Adamson, that your vote was indeed recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 84 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 30, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, not agreed. I call amendment 85 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. I already debated with amendment 18. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Question is amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a vote and members who cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 85 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 31, no 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 20 in the name of Rhoda Grant. Already debated with Amendment 18. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Moved. Okay, the question is that uh, Amendment 20 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. <laughs> and the result of the vote on amendment number 20 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes 50, no 64. There were no abstentions. Uh, the amendment is therefore not agreed. We move to group 10, Muirburn licences, grants and conditions. I call amendment 86 in the name of Emma Harper, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I'd point out that if amendment 89 is agreed to, uh, I cannot call amendment 90 due to a preemption. Uh, and I call on Emma Harper to move amendment 86 and speak to all the other amendments in the group. Ms Harper. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I know time is getting on, so I will not be speaking too long. Um, the need for a Muirburn season is well understood and was set out in the Hill Farming Act of 1946. It ensures that Muirburn is only carried out when the risk of economic, social and environmental damage is at a minimum. For example, the Muirburn season ends in spring to ensure that protected ground nests and birds are not disturbed during their breeding season. There are different permitted reasons for carrying out Muirburn. Just give me a wee second just to finish this thought, please, at 1903. There are different permitted reasons for carrying out Muirburn, depending on whether this is on peatland and whether or not this is carried out during the Muirburn season. And I will give way to Mr, Mr. Carson. Uh, I thank the member for giving away. It, it's a reference to uh, nature, conservation, whatever. Can, can the member quantify the impact she alluded to uh, in the respect of Muirburn on Merlin? Emma Harper. I don't really understand what whatever meant, President Officer, but I'm sure that the member and all members will agree on the principle of minimising the risk of economic, social and environmental damage to um, our, our, our woodland, our peatland areas and our, our grouse areas, and licences will be granted with appropriately in season and only granted outside of the season if this is satisfied by the licensing authority that it is absolutely necessary to do so. So section 11 of the bill already restricts when the Scottish ministers or nature Scott is, if this function is delegated to them, can grant a Muirburn licence. And my amendments 86 alongside 88 and 89 add further restrictions and would mean that a Muirburn licence cannot be granted to burn on non-peatland out with the Muirburn season for the purpose of managing the habitats of moorland game or wildlife or for the purpose of improving the grazing potential of moorland for livestock. My amendments also mean, however, that a licence can be granted to burn on non-peatland out with the season for the purpose of conserving, restoring, enhancing or managing the natural environment, preventing or reducing the risk of wildfires and for research, but only if it is considered necessary to do so, as I have just mentioned. This is in line with the principle of minimising the risk of economic, social and environmental damage and reflects what is currently set out in the 1946 Act. I believe there are, there are important safeguards to ensure that this bill operates as intended, and I move Amendment 86, Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you, Ms Harper. I call Rachel Hamilton to speak to Amendment 87 and other amendments in the group. Ms Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to Finlay Carson's um, intervention to Emma Harper, I mean, it's just important that for the reference that she made regarding um, Mirburn, uh, we don't understand what she means by the impact that it may have environmentally to the species such as the Merlin, and that was the crux of the question, and I would ask the same thing if she could um, address that in her closing. Um, but Amendment 87 is as previous. Um, it serves the same purpose as I debated Amendments 49 and 61 in my name, and it creates a rebuttable presumption in favour of granting licences and changing the word from may to must, provide prospective licence applicants and stakeholders with greater certainty. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I call Edward Mountain to speak to Amendment 90 and other amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, Presiding officer, good news, I think. Uh, I am not going to move Amendment 92 uh, for the simple reason that, having looked at the rationale behind it, I've been taken advice, and I'm uh, conscious to uh, I'm pleased to understand that, that it is not the government's intention to issue Muirburn licences for set periods of time. My concern was that they were going to, and, and that a Muirburn uh, procedure for a area of ground may be, over, may be for a long period of time. And we'll come on to the reasons of Muirburn uh, uh, and how you carry it out and why you carry it out later on in this. But it is a rotational basis, and, and eight years would be the minimum in my mind. But as they haven't set a target length, uh, I, I don't propose to move it. As far as amendments 90 and 91, to me they were consequential amendments to an earlier amendment of mine that failed, and so I have no wish to push them. Presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I call Alistair Allen to speak to Amendment 21 and other amendments in the group. Dr Allen. Thank you. The requirement for Muirburn practitioners to be trained was widely discussed and indeed widely supported at stages one and two. Uh, there was near universal agreement from stakeholders that due to the risks and the potential 
uh, for widespread damage when Muirburn is not done correctly, uh, that anyone involved should be trained. Now, notwithstanding um, Mr Mountain's um, stated scepticism about all forms uh, of training in general, I, I do understand that it was un anticipated that being suitably trained would always be a requirement of the Muirburn licence. However, my Amendment 21 sets out this expectation on the face of the Bill by making it a condition of every Muirburn licence. I believe that it is reasonable to set out this condition so that Muirburn licence holders understand what is expected of them and in turn making it easier to comply with the legislation. Thank you, Dr Allen. I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 22 and other amendments in the group. Minister. My apologies, President Officer. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, uh, amendments 86, 88 and 89 are all amendments that were brought forward by Kate Forbes at stage two and I asked her not to press them, so I am very happy to see them come back in the name of Emma Harper. And she sets out amendments 88, 86, 88 and 89 make it clear that a licence must not be granted out with the Muirburn season for certain purposes and for other purposes and should only be granted outside the Muirburn season if it is necessary to do so. As I have said throughout this process, I recognise the importance of Muirburn in preventing wildfires and that purpose, alongside other limited purposes, continue to be allowed under licence outside of the Muirburn season through these amendments. So I would encourage members to support these amendments. And coming back to the point that Finlay Carson and Rachel Hamilton have both just made, the protection of Merlin is about where they nest and being caught up in fires, um, but I think he was a bit late in coming in in that grouping. Amendment 87 inserts that the licensing authority on receiving an application that meets the requirements in Section 10 must grant a Muirburn licence rather than may grant a Muirburn licence. As a public body, Nature Scott are required to act reasonably and will be granting Muirburn licence where it is appropriate to do so. However, I recognise that some would like increased assurance that they would be granted a licence if they meet the eligibility criteria, which the Bill makes extensive provision for, and I am happy to support that amendment. Edward Mountain's amendments 90 and 91 taken together restrict the purposes for which Muirburn, Muirburn can be carried out during the season. These amendments only allow a licence to be granted during the Muirburn season for managing of habitats of moorland game or wildlife or for improving the grazing potential of moorland for livestock. I'm not sure if this was Edward Mountain's intention, but this is completely at odds with everything that he has been discussed throughout this bill, and I'm glad that he's not going to press them. Amendment 92 inserts a condition to require that a Muirburn licence must be for eight years and can only be shorter if deemed appropriate for environmental reasons. As I said at stage two, when Edward Mountain posed a similar amendment, our climate is changing continually, as we've all witnessed in the last year, and we need the ability to respond to that. That changing climate and weather has also resulted in more wildfires, including on peatland. This amendment would therefore defeat one of the core purposes of this bill to allow us to regulate and control in, much, in a much more orderly fashion the making of Muirburn. The current provisions also allow Nature, Nature Scott the flexibility to issue licences for periods of time thought appropriate in individual circumstances. And they will be granting licences based on a burning plan and I expect that some applicants will submit longer term burning plans and that Nature Scott will be approving them. However, for other applicants, a long-term plan may be quite onerous, and therefore this amendment would be working against them. And again, I'm glad that he's not going to press that amendment. As Alistair Allen has set out, Amendment 21 makes it clear to applicants what is expected of them. The requirement for an individual involved in making Muirburn to undergo training is an area that has near unanimous agreement. I will therefore be supporting this amendment and encourage members to vote in favour of it. Amendment 22 is a technical amendment. It simply corrects a typo in section 13A1 of the bill by replacing the word receive with receiving. To ensure clarity in the wording of the bill, I would encourage members to support this amendment as well. Amendment 23 inserts that any fee payable in connection with a Muirburn training course is reasonable. As a public body, Nature Scott is required to act reasonably, which includes in relation to fees. However, having listened closely to what was said at stage two, this amendment looks to provide reassurance that those making Muirburn will not be expected to pay unreasonable fees to under, undertake a Muirburn training course. For this reason, I encourage members to support that amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call Emma Harper to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 86. 
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, apologies for not picking up what the essence of Mr Carson's uh, first intervention was, but uh, Rachel Hamilton did help clarify, and so did the Minister. My understanding is that Merlin breed on grouse moors, and sometimes when, you, when moor burn is, is carried out, that can affect these birds uh, and their ability to survive. So I won't re-rehearse what I said and move my amendments. I'm just glad to hear that the Minister agrees with the reasons for bringing forward Forward the amendments and I will move them in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harper. The question is that Amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, I call Amendment 87. Uh, sorry, the Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 87 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 86. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Uh, the question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Uh, the Parliament is no, the Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and I would ask members to cast their vote now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 87 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 90, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore Agreed. I uh, call Amendment uh, 88 in the name of Emma Harper, already debated with Amendment 86. Emma Harper to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 89 in the name of Emma Harper, already debated with Amendment 86. I remind members that if Amendment 89 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 90 by way of preemption. Emma Harper to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. Ms Harper, the question is that Amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I therefore now call Amendment 91 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 86. And for the record, could Mr Mountain clarify whether he is moving or not moving? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. And I now call Amendment 92 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 86. And again, for clarity, uh, Mr Mountain, is Mr Mountain moving or not moving? Not moved. Not moved, thank you. Uh, the I now call, apologies, Amendment 21 in the name of Alistair Allen, already debated with Amendment 86. Alistair Allen to move or not move? Move. Uh, thank you, Dr Allen. The question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. We now turn to Group 11, uh, Muirburn Register and Notice. I call Amendment 93 in the name of Edward Mountain, grouped with Amendments 96 and 101. I call on Edward Mountain to move Amendment 93 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This is my attempt to move the Government and Nature Scott into the 21st century by establishing a register of licences which in my mind should be done online and it should, be allowed, it should allow people to interrogate that register to, and the register should include a name and description of the land where the licence that has been granted applies. Uh, it will be, of course, up to Scottish ministers 
uh, to determine the form and manner uh, that the registers be kept, uh, but it must be accessible online at all times. Seems fairly straightforward, seems fairly open. And uh, it also, uh, my amendment also allows uh, for um, public inspection. Now, the other thing that, that this does is allow uh, us to move away from what the government is trying to stick to, that every time somebody wants to do a bit of meal burn, they have to place an advert in the local paper. 500 quid every time you go into the local paper. I think it was actually the government during COVID that kept many of the local papers going by pay, paying for the adverts. But when it comes to other areas where this is, was required, under the crofting legislation, which Dr Allen would know all about, crofters objected to and still object to the adverts having to be placed into local papers because of the expense involved. So that's what one of my, my amendments will uh, try and avoid. So this is about literally establishing a register, making it available uh, to the public, allowing the public to interrogate it and to keep costs down for all involved. I'm not sure what's, to like, what's not to like about it, but I'm sure there'll be something. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. I call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. As I said, when Edward Mountain brought forward nearly identical amendments at stage two, I am sympathetic to the intentions behind them. I agree that transparency is important, not just in the way these licenses will operate, but for all the licenses operated by NatureScot. That is why, under the Butte House Agreement, we have made the commitment to review the wider species licensing systems and the introduction of a public register of licences to improve transparency, bearing in mind data protection and safety of licence holders. That review is now well underway, and I think it would be better to wait for it to conclude to allow Scottish ministers to consider all the options around creating a register or registers which could potentially cover a range of licences. That would seem more appropriate rather than providing here for a register only in respect of Muirburn licences granted under this Bill. It would also allow the Scottish Government to fully consider the GDPR implications of creating a public register. For these re reasons, I hope that Edward Mountain will not press these amendments, and if he does, I would encourage members to vote against them. Thank you, Minister. I call on Edward Mountain to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 93. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And there's a surprise the Minister is not for an open register that can be openly interrogated by the public and that people can see what's actually been offered as far as licence is concerned. I, I, I'm at a loss, uh, truthfully, at this stage, Presiding Officer, to understand why the Government is not prepared to embrace it, saying that nothing today, but there may be something tomorrow. Uh, I, I do move the amendment in my name, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. The question is: This amendment 93 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 93 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 51, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not 
Agreed. I call Amendment 22 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 86. Minister, move formally. Uh, move, President Officer. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 86. Minister, to move formally. Move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. We now move to Group 12 on Muirburn Code. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Rhoda Grant, grouped with Amendments 25, 26, 94, 95 and 28. I point out that if Amendment 26 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 94 and 95 by way of a preemption. I call on Rhoda Grant to move Amendment 24 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Currently, the Muirburn Code does not have to be laid before Parliament. At stage two, I brought forward amendments to scrutinise the Code under a super-affirmative procedure. However, this was rejected by Government. I believe all significant develop, de delegated powers should be properly scrutinised. Therefore, my Amendment 26 inserts a procedure mirroring the Government's process for agreeing the Dear Management Code of Practice. This means ministers must approve Scottish Natural Heritage or Nature Scott's code and lay it before Parliament under the negative procedure. Amendment 28 removes the code from the provisions that ministers can delegate to Nature Scott, as this would not be appropriate given that they would develop the new procedure. Amendments 24 and 25 are consequential to 26 and place initial responsibility for preparing and reviewing the Mew Burden Code with Nature Scott instead of Scottish ministers. This is a process the Scottish Government have used before and I therefore hope that they can accept it. I, thank you, Ms Grant. I, and uh, Could you please move the amendment? Um, can I move Amendment 24, please? Thank you, Ms Grant. I call on Alistair Allen to speak to Amendment 94 and other amendments in the group. Dr Allen. The bill currently sets out that people interested in or affected by the making of Muirburn will be consulted when the Muirburn Code is being prepared or reviewed. I think that in practice that would probably also include when it is being revised, but for the avoidance of doubt, my Amendment 94 sets it out clearly on the face of the bill. Thank you, Dr Allen. I now call on Edward Mountain to speak to Amendment 95 and other uh, amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So many papers on my desk, so many amendments, and I'll get to the right one. And I'll get to one, hopefully, that the uh, Government will allow. This is, uh, is a, um, Amendment 95 is to ensure that the Government consult with land managers, something that I've been asking all along for them to do. And it's a simple amendment to allow uh, land managers to have an input into this code. But uh, I suspect that... that that, that's not appropriate, but I wait to hear the answers, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. I don't, in fact, now see any other member that wishes to speak, so I will now call the minister. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, presiding officer, I cannot support Rhoda Grant's amendments 24, 25, 26, and 28. These amendments remo remove the ability for Scottish ministers to delegate the preparation of the Muirburn Code to Nature Scott and requires that Nature Scott be responsible for it and the Scottish ministers instead must approve it. The amendments also state that the Code must be laid before the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Parliament can determine that the Code should not come into effect. However, the provisions do not provide any insight or direction on what would happen if the Scottish Parliament determined the updated Code should not come into effect. Alongside this, I believe that if passed, these changes would create an unnecessary additional burden that would actually slow down the process of updating the Muirburn Code considerably. As I have set out in response to a similar amendment from Rhoda Grant at Stage 2, this is meant to be a practical working document that provides up-to-date guidance for licence holders, and it is not clear to me what laying the Muirburn Code before Parliament will achieve. The Muirburn Code will be published on the Nature Scott website and we will, of course, ensure that Parliament is up kept updated of the processes of the development when it is published. 
These amendments would create an unnecessary statutory requirement for what is meant to be active, up-to-date guidance. And while I can understand the intent for the first updated version of the Code following this Bill, it really would not make practical sense to put every future, future iteration to respond to circumstances and, in some cases, to do so nimbly and flexibly through such a statutory process. So, for all these reasons, I encourage members to vote against these amendments. As stated by Alistair Allen, Amendment 94 clarifies that when the Muirburn Code is being revised, people interested on in or affected by the making of Muirburn will be consulted. And I think we can all agree that it's a sensible amendment, and I would encourage members to vote for it in, uh, in favour of these amendments. Amendment 95 reflects that the consultation on the development of the Muirburn Code must include those that are involved in land management. And I know that Nature Scott are working with a wide range of stakeholders on the development of the codes included in this bill. And I am hoping to join one of the working group sessions, so I would encourage members to vote in favour of this amendment, much to Mr Mountain's surprise, I would imagine. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Rosa Grant to wind up, to press or withdraw Amendment 24. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I may be disappointed, but not totally surprised that the Minister has rejected this, but his criticism of my amendment, which mirrors the Dear Management Code of Practice procedure, is, is amazing and startling that the government has actually legislated and now criticises their own legislation. So I will be pressing my amendment. Thank you, Ms Grant. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. If Parliament is not agreed, there will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 24 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 50, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not Agreed. I call Amendment 25 in the name of Rosa Grant, already debated with Amendment 24. I ask Rosa Grant whether she is moving or not moving. Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. I now call Amendment 26 in the name of Rosa Grant, already debated with Amendment 24. And I remind members that if Amendment 26 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 94 or 95 by way of preemption. Rosa Grant to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Uh, the question uh, I now call uh, Amendment 94 in the name of Alistair Allen, already debated with Amendment 24. Alistair Allen to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment uh, 95 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 24. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved, Presiding Thank you, Mr Mountain. The question is that Amendment 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is therefore agreed. And, uh, and I now call Amendment 96 in the name of Edward Mountain. Already debated with Amendment 93. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved. Thank you, Mr Mountain. The question is that Amendment 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Uh, therefore, there will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 96 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 50, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to group 13 on Muirburn season. I call amendment 97 in the name of Edward Mountain, grouped with amendments 98, 99, 100 and 27. I call on Edward Mountain to move amendment 97 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. About two weeks ago, my wife asked me what we were going to do for my 63rd birthday. And I said, well, you can do what you want, but tonight I'm going to be talking about something really important, or that night uh, I'm going to talk about something really important in the Scottish Parliament, and that's the Muirburn uh, Bill. So here I am talking about this, and I, I might get one more than one vote. Uh, so here I am this evening, and what I want to talk about, uh, if I may, under the, uh, this section is the fact that how Scotland is so very different. It is different from one end of Scotland to the other. And I think that was the point that I tried to make uh, during the stage two amendments. And, that, and what happened was that was not accepted and Scotland was considered to be the same. I tried to explain that the warmth heads from the south north and that as things warm up in the borders, things could still be cold north. In fact, it can be much more local than that. In the low-lying hills around Tomintal, it can be positively warm at an altitude of 1,000 foot. But if you go further up into the hills, up into Glenarn, for example, at 1,800 foot, it can still be cold and covered in snow. That's why having a season and a bland season that covers the whole of Scotland is wrong. That's why I am suggesting that there needs to be amendments uh, to allow Muirburn to be carried out out with the, a set defined period. And funnily enough, I, I, I seem to remember the Minister at stage one uh, actually arguing that point as well. He seems to have changed his tune since he became a Minister. I'm not quite sure why that's happened. No doubt he will enlighten us. So Amendment 97 is to give uh, the chance uh, for the uh, Minister to extend, the Scottish Government to extend the period of Muirburn to the 15th of April. Of course, not just on a whim, but on the approval of the experts that we've heard about earlier, Scottish natural heritage. So that gives a little bit of flexibility. So if, for example, as we had not many years ago, where all of the high hills are covered in snow, uh, right up until early April, that you could burn once that snow had lifted uh, because you couldn't guarantee it would be uh, clear in March. Now, I've listened to the arguments that were put forward by uh, organisations and RSPB, uh, to name one, say that the breeding seasons come earlier. I'm pretty sure that there's not many birds that breed in snow and they don't lay their eggs as the snow's melting. They will wait a bit of time before they move into that habitat. So by extending the season by a mere 15 days with the approval of SNH uh, seems to be appropriate. Amendment 98 is to take into account annual variations in weather conditions and particularly geographical areas. Some years I will be planting in, in the Murray Firth as early as the middle of February. Other years, it can be late as the middle of April. It depends on what, the ra what rain we've had, what conditions we've had, and you can't make the same decision every year. What I know is that eventually things will dry out and I will get a chance to carry out the operations that are needed. And that's what we need to allow uh, keepers uh, to do. And, and that's why we need the flexibility. The next part of our Amendment 99 is when we're taking this is to include land managers in, in uh, this whole process and make sure they're consulted. And Amendment 100, I feel sure, will reach uh, uh, the Minister for the simple reason 
What it is doing is giving the scope for SNH to suggest to the Minister that the season could be extended for up to 20 days. Now, that gives the Minister time to consider whether that's relevant. And as we've heard before, they are the experts. And the government only have to have regard to this. They don't have to do it. But if they don't do it, they have to explain why. Now, that seems to me a situation where everywhere, everyone is cooperating together and working together and working in the difficult conditions uh, that is the Scottish climate. And at different levels of Scotland, uh, it is different. I mean, I spoke to somebody the other day who said that they'd seen their first osprey. It won't be for until at least uh, uh, another 20 days, probably nearer a month, that we see the first ones back with us at home, uh, just because of the different climate conditions. That's what these amendments are trying to bring out, that Scotland's not all the same, that we are diverse, our country's diverse, and therefore we need flexibility within what could be just a very rigid plan. And, and that's why, Presiding Officer, I'm moving these amendments in my name, and I look to the Parliament to support them. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I now call on Rhoda Grant to speak to Amendment 27 and other amendments in the group. Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My Amendment 27 ensures that any changes to the Mirburn season are properly scrutinised. As with other amendments, I listened to the Minister at Stage 2 and amended the length of time these regulations be laid. These powers are required because climate change is already impacting on bird nesting seasons, and this is likely to continue. Therefore, we may need to change the Muirburn season timing. However, this must be consulted on and laid before Parliament to ensure that the changes are necessary and that there are no unintended consequences. It is difficult to understand why the Minister is so averse to this kind of scrutiny, and you would almost believe he believes that the Government will be in power forever. Thank you, Ms Grant. And I now call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, President Officer, Amendment 97 would allow the Muirburn season to be extended to the 15th of April with the permission of Nature Scott. At Stage 2, we had very good reason to bring forward the end of Muirburn season to protect ground nesting birds, and the Bill was amended to that effect. To then accept an amendment that pushes the season back to the middle of April, albeit in limited circumstances, would not be appropriate nor good practice. However, I do understand that the science around Muirburn is constantly evolving and that the impacts of climate change mean we may need to adapt our approach in the future. That is why Scottish ministers already have a power, that is why Scottish ministers already have a power in section 16 of the bill to amend the Muirburn season if they thought it necessary or expedient to do so for the purposes of conserving, restoring or enhancing the natural environment, preventing the risk of wildfire or in relation to climate change. And the benefit of being in government to answer Edward Mountain's question is that you get access to much more information, including the stats like the two million uh, hectares of peatland that we have, 75% of which is regraded, is degraded. But as I've already said, Nature Scott have provision to extend if it's deemed necessary to do so for the powers I've just talked about. Importantly, this power is subject to the affirmative procedure giving Parliament an enhanced scrutiny role. And there is a requirement to consult those likely to be interested in or affected by the making of Muirburn, ensuring that this power would be used proportionately. Amendment 97 provides no such scrutiny. For those reasons, I cannot support this amendment, and if pressed, I would encourage members to vote against it. Amendment 98 would change the regulation power in section 16, so that if Scottish ministers want to amend the Muirburn season dates through secondary legislation for the purpose of preventing or reducing the risk of wildfires causing harm to people or damage to property, they would need to take into account annual variations in weather conditions in particular geographic areas. This amendment is unnecessary because the Bill already sets out that the power to change the Muirburn season dates can make different provisions for different purposes, including for different land and for different years. This would naturally take into account the weather conditions across the land. The Bill therefore already provides the ability for regulations to provide different Muirburn season dates depending on the weather conditions and geography, which could, for example, include land which is or is not at a high risk of wildfire. I therefore do not think that this amendment is necessary. I cannot support this amendment, and I encourage members to vote against it. 
I would like to say I was pleased to work with Mr Mountain on Amendment 99, but he never actually came to see me, despite the fact that every other member who I dealt with having amendments that have been agreed so far did. So, yep, I will. Edward Mind. Um, I, I really don't mind if you want to throw stones at me, uh, but the point I would make to you, the reason why I didn't come and see you, Mr Fairley, is that I happen to be in Australia for my son's wedding. And if you begrudge me going to my son's wedding, then, then so be it. I thought you were bigger. Minister? Mr Mountain, I absolutely take on board that you may have been out of the country. However, you have said on various occasions throughout this debate that you have not had the ability to talk to me and you haven't had the ability to make these recommendations. However, you have an Amendment 99, which I will be happy uh, to support. Minister, we need to speak through the... Amendment 100 will allow Nature Scott to recommend that Muirburn season is extended by up to 20 days and that Scottish ministers must either do so or give reasons why not. As I've just explained, the power to change the Muirburn season dates by regulation already includes a requirement to consult Nature Scott as well as those interested in or affected by Muirburn. Nature Scott is an executive non-departmental public body, which is an organisation that carries out administrative, commercial, executive or regulatory functions on behalf of the Scottish Government. They are not, however, part of the Scottish Government or the Scottish Administration. While Nature Scott provides essential advice to the Scottish Ministers, as an unelected body, it is not their role to set the direction of policy, which is what the recommendation in Amendment 100 would be in effect. I cannot support this amendment and I encourage members to vote against it. As I have said for the other similar amendments lodged by Ms Grant, Amendment 27 adds unnecessary additional burden on Scottish Parliament when there are, there are already established procedures in place for changes through secondary legislation. Any regulations to change the Muirburn season would be subject to the, affirmative, the affirmative procedure under which the instrument will be laid in draft before Parliament for normally 54 days. This will give Parliament the opportunity to consider the draft instrument and take evidence and then vote on it. That is the correct procedure for any such amending instrument, and both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee agreed with this approach in their Stage 1 reports. If passed, this amendment could lead to unnecessary delays in changing the date of the Muirburn season, which could have consequences for the natural environment. I have listened very carefully to what Rhoda Grant said today and during Stage 2 when she brought forward these similar amendments. However, I do not believe she has made the compelling case to support why any future use of those enabling powers should be subject to greater scrutiny or why the standard parliamentary process for considering an instrument would not be sufficient. I will therefore not be supporting this amendment and I will encourage members not to support it either. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call Edwin Mountain to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 97. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I'm disappointed the Minister keeps going back to a figure of 75% of Scotland's peatland being degraded. It may be before his time. I certainly remember when grants were being made by the Scottish uh, Office in those days to train peatlands with grips. Well, yes, we've learnt a lot by then, but it's not all down to the way moorland's been managed for, for wildlife. In fact, we know from a fact that wet moorland is probably better uh, for grouse and wildlife than dry moorland. But it was the Scottish Office that encouraged us to, to degrade the peatland, and that's why there is so much uh, degraded peatland. I would also point out that, no, I don't accept uh, the Minister's point about uh, Amendments 97 and 98. I believe Scotland is very different. I believe parts of it are very different and therefore coming up with a general code. And yes, I accept that the Minister will accept Amendment 99. It was an amendment that he asked me to lodge and I was happy to do it. And as far as Amendment 100 is concerned, I don't believe there's anything wrong with giving SNH the powers uh, to apply to ministers to extend the season. It shows that all the powers, not with the government, is with some of their agencies who can be approached by the managers on the ground. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment to my name. Thank you, Mr Mountain. The question is that Amendment 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has not agreed. Uh, there will be a division, and members should cast their vote now.
vote is now closed. Point of order, Mark Rusco. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr. Rusco. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 97 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 47, no, 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 98 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with amendment 97. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 98 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 98 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 51, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 99. In the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 97. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved. <clears throat> Thank you. The question is that Amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. Uh, I now call Amendment 100 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Already debate, I now call Amendment 100 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment uh, 97. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Uh, in the spirit of cooperation, moved. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. <laughs> the question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 100 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 47, no, 66. There were no abstentions and therefore the amendment is not Agreed. I call Amendment 27 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 97. Rhoda Grant to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 27 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 51, no, 62. There were no uh, abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 101 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with amendment 93. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. Uh, 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 if members will be with us uh, a second, we're looking into this. Okay, I will call that uh, vote again. The question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 101 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 51, no, 62. There are no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 28 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with amendment 24. Rhoda Grant, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. The question uh, I now sorry, call Amendment 102 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 18. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 102 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. The 
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 102 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 30, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We will now move to Group 14, definition of peat and peatland. I call Amendment 103 in the name of Edward Mountain, grouped with Amendments 104, 106, 107, 108 and 109. I remind members that Amendments 103 and 104 are direct alternatives, that is to say they can both be moved and decided upon, but the text of whichever is the last agreed to is what will appear in the Bill. Edward, I call on Edward Mountain to move Amendment 103 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I, men, I move Amendment 103 in my name. Uh, this has been an interesting uh, debate on this particular subject about peat depth, and I, and I find it quite interesting because I think it's sh shown up a great deal of misinformation, and that is that uh, shallow peat is better for burning on than, than deeper peat. As, as a generalisation, of course, it's entirely wrong. It depends on the, the peat the schist below it, and the peat depth actually can get much thinner as you go higher up the hill. So if you get to 1,800 foot, the peat depth may be quite short, uh, quite thin, sorry, and the regrowth period uh, for heather on that will be extremely slow. In fact, it will be wind clipped. So the thought of burning on higher bits of, of the hill, uh, certainly uh, at feet, you know, up 1,900 feet or above, absolutely should be a no-no, despite the fact that this bill says that it would be fine because the peat is shallow enough. That is why this figure is just so arbitrary. Now, I started off in amendments uh, uh, at stage two suggesting a deeper depth uh, than the one I'm suggesting today. I have brought the depth back, but I've done it to do it uh, to encourage debate on this subject because it's not the peat that you're actually burning it's the matter on top of the peat that you're burning and those of you people that have been out and taken time to go out and see muir burn taking place will know there's a great difference in how you burn bits of hill and the speed that fires pass over it in fact i remember an area in caithness where i was involved in burning a bit of hill uh, where it actually got away from us, got out of control, and went through a relatively newly planted woodland. The speed of the fire through that, because it was through grassland, was such it didn't damage the trees, funnily enough, didn't damage the fence posts or the fence round it. In fact, it moved through so quickly there was no damage at all. And what was interesting to know is that the trees grew better afterwards because they weren't crowded out by vegetation. So the point of my amendment is to try and force the debate on this. I'll be interested to hear why Colin believes that going to an even shallower depth will, will be the way forward, whereas uh, on the shallow depth you'll probably end up uh, with uh, just a pioneer uh, and page climax vegetation, i.e. short vegetation, rather than the climax vegetation, the old rank heather, uh, which you're trying to get rid of to stimulate regrowth and to encourage uh, birds to use that area and mammals to use that area. So I, I could talk for hours on this, presiding officer. It, it's late into the evening, uh, and I'm sure everyone's looking forward uh, to going home. So I will just leave it there and make a summation of the points I hear at the end. Uh, uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, thank you, Mr Martin. There's a bit uh, too many conversations going on and, and members back shouldn't be turned to the, the chair. Thank you. Uh, I now call Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 104 and other amendments in the group. Mr Smith. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the key aims of the bill is to protect our peatlands by limiting burning on them. So the definition of what is peatland does matter. The bill as it stands places that definition on the face of the bill, and it states in a quote, land where the soil has a layer of peat with a thickness of more than 40 centimetres. The consequence of this definition is that extensive areas of shallow peat of a depth less than 40 centimetres will be treated as not peatland, even though they are functionally part of a peatland and are often the most vulnerable areas. 
If we are to have depth in the definition, and if that is to be on the face of the bill, I believe the scientific evidence points to the need for a reduction to 30 centimetres, which is an internationally recognised level, and it would offer more protection. A 30 centimetre peak depth is a definition used in the, the peatland code and in the UK peatland strategy, and Natural England will be applying this to common standards monitoring. Scottish Forestry also have recognised the importance of limiting damaging practices in peat and are not accepting any forestry grant scheme applications, which include ploughing on soils where peat depth exceeds 10 centimetres. Lowering the depth to 30 centimetres, as proposed in my amendment, would have the effect of increasing the area of land that is treated as peatland under the terms of the bill, and so include some of the shallower peatland areas, which are themselves important large carbon store. The Government's approach um, is to set that depth level at 40 centimetres. That has almost universal opposition. It has no scientific basis for it, and it is entirely arbitrary, an international outlier that seems to be based on little more than splitting the difference between 50 centimetres and 30 centimetres. I will take an intervention on that. Yeah. Kate Forbes. Um, uh, the member used the word arbitrary. Would he come to the conclusion, though, that 30 also sounds fairly arbitrary? Uh, and secondly, that any bill is only as good as its ability to be enforced, and for a practitioner, having to measure to a degree of centimetres is extremely difficult. Colin Smith. The, the first point I would make is that there is absolute international precedent for 30 centimetres. That isn't the case for 40 centimetres. And secondly, Kate Forbes' government are proposing a level of 40 centimetres. That needs to be measured as well. So if there are difficulties with 30 centimetres, there are equally difficulties when it comes to the measurement of 40 centimetres. The 40 centimetre figure, however, is frankly the equivalent of making policy on the basis of tossing a coin. It is, frankly, simply splitting the difference, and there is no scientific basis for that. Setting that level at 40 centimetres, in my view, is a backward step, but lowering the depth to 30 centimetres would improve the protection of peatlands at a time when we need to be doing everything we can to protect and restore those important areas. Now, I note that the Bill does allow Ministers to amend the definition by regulation, which they would have to consult with Nature Scott and others on. However, as it stands, there is no requirement for them to do so on a regular basis. So, if the Minister is adamant that the Government wishes to stick to the arbitrary 40 centimetre figure, amendments 106, 107, 108 and 109 would, at the very least, require a regular review of the definitions of peat and peatland at the very most every five years, taking into account relative, relevant scientific expertise. So I hope, therefore, at the very least, if the Minister, as it seems, is not minded to take a more scientific approach to the setting of peak depth in this Bill, he will at the very least commit to having a regular review of that definition. Thank you. I call Ariane Burgess. Pre Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have sympathy with the amendments from Colin Smith, and I thank him for following up on the debate on this issue, which was had at stage two. As committee members know, we heard evidence from stakeholders, including IUCN's International Peatland Programme, that the whole issue of defining peat based on depth is arbitrary. It's a, def it's a definition that stems entirely from policy de developed immediately after World War II, when Britain was concerned with mapping and maximising its use of domestic natural resources. It's not related to our current problems of reducing our impact on the climate and reversing the decline of nature. However, right now, the evidence base is not strong enough, and it's good to hear assurance from the Minister this evening that the matter will be reconsidered as the evidence base develops and how the government will support research in, to improve our understanding of peatland ecosystems and how to protect them. Thank you. I call Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Whilst I'm not tabling my am amendments in this group, I'm keen to put on my record my support for Amendment 103 in the name of Edward Mountain, my colleague. It's worth stating at the outset that we do not support using a below-ground metric peat depth 
to regulate an above-ground activity near Bern. The approach is illogical and at odds with the evidence we received from practitioners and experts on the topic. If peat depth is going to be used, we would support defining peatland as where the peat is deeper than 50 centimetres. That, there is a very important reason for this. Uh, there is a national peat depth survey data available at the 50 centimetre threshold. Such data could be instrumental in informing which areas constitute peatland and which areas constitute non-peatland, making things easier for both practitioners and the regulator. The importance of this data has been recognised elsewhere too. The then Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs ensured that such data was available before implementing the heather and grass burning regulations, which imposes similar requirements on designated sites. For this reason, we support retaining the 50 centimetre depth. I also have significant concerns about Colin Smith's amendments in this group. It is clear that the intention here is to render the making of Muirburn as difficult as possible for practitioners without properly understanding the interactions between Muirburn and Peatland. And if Colin Smith took the time to familiarise himself with the long-term science set up to deal with this complex issue, he would understand that there is no scientific basis for the position he is adopting in respect of 30 centimetres. And I am concerned that his other amendments, 106 and 109, are being pushed with a view to leveraging such a change to 30 centimetres in five years, yes. Colin Smith. If it's my requirement to look at the scientific evidence, why is Rachel Hamilton running scared from having a regular review every five years that takes into account that scientific evidence? Presumably, she's doing so because she knows her argument for 50 centimetres has no scientific basis for it whatsoever. So why is she scared of having a review every five years to put that to their test, rather than simply leaving it at 40 centimetres, which is the case as the bill stands at the moment? What's wrong with the review? Rachel Hamilton. The proposal that Colin Smith has made has absolutely no scientific basis. Um, the, the point I am making, Colin Smith, is that there is already national peak depth survey data available at the 50 centimetre threshold. Kate Forbes, when she intervened, is absolutely correct. The use of an arbitrary peatland depth lacks scientific reasoning, since peatland is not burned down by Muirburn and furthermore it's impractical for land managers to be expected to measure peak depth across the land as part of a licensing regime. Thank you. Thank you. Call the Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and I can tell you this one has been a doozy. Amendments 103 and 104 offer alternatives to what the definition of peat should be for the purposes of Muirburn licences. And I want to thank Colin Smith and Edward Mountain for laying these amendments, which has allowed us to have this debate in the Chamber today. The approach taken in the Bill, in line with the wider Muirburn provisions, follows the precautionary principle and the depth of 40 centimetres arose from that principle. Amendments 103 and 104 demonstrate that there are opposing views as to what the definition of peatland should be, as we've seen throughout this passage of this bill. Some would like it to be shallower, some would like it to be deeper. This still leads me to conclude that 40 centimetres is the correct definition to use in relation to the potential risks associated with Muirburn on peatland. The public consultation on the definition of peatland was similarly divided. 38% of the respondents thought it should be 40 centimetres, but those who disagreed with 40 centimetres were split between wanting to keep it at 50 centimetres and others arguing that it should be 30 centimetres or less. And as noted at stage two, 40 centimetres is also the depth that is being moved to in England. However, in recognition of the divergence of views and to ensure that the definition keeps pace with scientific research, the Bill allows Scottish Ministers to amend the definition of peatland by regulations. This must be done in consultation with Nature Scott and any other person they consider likely to be interested in or affected by making Muirburn. Any regulations developed to amend these definitions would therefore be subject to consultation and also enhanced parliamentary scrutiny, as they will be subject to the affirmative procedure. I therefore hope that amendments 103 and 104 are not pressed, and if they are, I'd urge members to vote against them. Amendment 106, 107, 108 and 109, in the name of Colin Smith, require Scottish ministers to review the peak depth every five years. They also require that when undertaking the review, Scottish ministers must consult with Nature Scott and individuals or organisations, organisations with relevant scientific expertise. I wholeheartedly heartedly agree with the underlying principle for this amendment. There is still significant scientific development happening in this area. 
In the Scottish Government, it has been clear that if new evidence emerges that a different approach is required, it will reconsider the definition of peat used in the Bill. However, the Bill did not include a statutory review period by which such a review should be undertaken in the Bill. This is because the Scottish Government believes that the timing of any future review should be informed by the latest scientific developments and publication of any new and relevant scientific research. And I consider that this is the correct approach to take, rather than one proposed by this amendment, which would simply tie future reviews to an arbitrary five-year cycle. Yes, I'll take your amendment. Colin Smith. The Minister accept that actually what the amendment says is that within five years, so it can be reviewed at any time that scientific evidence comes forward. You don't have to wait for five years. Does it not accept that there is a concern that there is a ability of ministers to uh, change the depth by regulation, but there is not a requirement to do so? And my amendment would put that requirement on ministers to do so, and it could be any time within that five-year period. Minister. President, officer, our landscape is changing, and we are going to get better at understanding the science by the procedures involved in the licensing scheme that we have brought forward. And we can use that data to better regulate as necessary, which is why we are committed to reviewing this bill in its entirety, as will be seen in the amendment that will come forward with Eleanor Whittam later on. So I would therefore ask members to vote against Mr Smith's amendment 106, 107, 108 and 109. Thank you. And I call Edward Mountain to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 103. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, yes, that was an interesting debate uh, where we, I think, worked out that the, the depth of the peat was almost an arbitrary figure. Um, and somebody had drawn it out of a hat to come up with a figure that seemed to be right. Colin thinks that it was me that drew it out of a hat. I think it was him that drew it out of a hat. And the Minister thinks... He drew it out of a hat, but he got the right one that was right in the middle. So it is totally arbitrary. It, 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 it's not scientifically based. Uh, what I would say to you uh, and, and to this parliament that Muirburn is all about doing it in rotational uh, system, and you work out, if you're managing a bit of hill, how much uh, Muirburn is required. Some hills uh, can do, stand Muirburn every four to five years and will be completely regrown in that period. Other bits will take significantly longer. Other bits that are uh, higher ground will take significantly longer as well. It's not all about peat depth, actually. It's as much about weather conditions, the facing, uh, the, slope, the way the slope face, uh, and, and the overall uh, fertility of, of the uh, peat and the schist below it. All of that adds, adds, up, and, sorry, adds up to how quickly uh, the vegetation grows. I, I, I truly believe that my figure is the right figure, uh, so much to the Minister's probably annoyance, I'm going to push it, uh, not to the surprise of Colin Smith. And his other amendments, I think, are Colin Smith's amendments, are interesting. But this time I'm going to agree with the Minister. I don't think they're needed in the bill. I think they're going to be covered elsewhere. So maybe on that happy note, Presiding Officer, I can sit down, um, having moved the amendment in my name. Thank you. Can I remind members that amendments 103 and 104 are direct alternatives and the text of whichever is the last agreed to is what will appear in the bill. So the question is that amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. Bear with us a moment. We are aware there is a technical hitch. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, colleagues. I'm going to call that vote again. The question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay, we're not agreed. There will be a division. And can I ask members to cast their votes now? The vote is closed. I call Sue Weber for a point of order. Signing officer, I actually cancelled the because uh, I put the point of order in before when I thought there was an issue, which Thank has now been resolved, and I've Thank managed you. to vote successfully. Thank you, Miss Weber. I can confirm your vote has been recorded. Thank you. I call Claire Adamson for a point of order. I I was in the same position, presiding officer. I believe my vote's been cast. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Adamson. I can confirm that your vote has been recorded. Thank you. And the long-awaited result of the vote on amendment number 103 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes 33, no 80. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 104 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with amendment 103. Colin Smith to move or not move? It moved. The question is that amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, there will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the
The result of the vote on amendment number 104 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 17, no, 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 105 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with amendment 18. Edward Mountain to move or not move? Uh, move, Sir Thank you. The question is that amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 105 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes 28, no 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 106 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with amendment 103. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, move. The question is that amendment 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The parliament is not agreed. There will be division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 106 in the name of Colin Smith is yes, 17, no, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 107 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated with amendment 103. Colin Smith to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Thank you. I call amendment 108 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated with amendment 103. Colin Smith to move or not to move? Not moved. Thank you. I call amendment 109 in the name of Colin Smith. Already debated with amendment 103. Colin Smith to move or not move? Thank you, Mr Smith. I call amendments 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34 and 35 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and I invite the Minister to move amendments 29 to 35 on block. Moved on block, President Officer. Thank you. And can I ask, does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 29 to 35? We, we are all content. 
Thank you. If no member objects, the question then is that amendments 29 to 35 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. We now move to Group 15, Review of Act Provisions, and I call Amendment 110 in the name of Eleanor Whittam in a group on its own. Eleanor Whittam to speak to and move Amendment 110. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At stage two of the bill, there was much discussion on the importance of ensuring that the provisions in the bill do what they set out to do. And I believe that this is only natural, given that this is a landmark bill for animal welfare and wildlife protection. This bill extends the powers of the Scottish SPCA inspectors to investigate wildlife crimes. It bans the use of snares and glue traps, and it puts into place new regulation on wildlife trapping, grouse shooting and muir burn. Throughout the bill's passage through the Parliament, there have been some concerns raised about the effect of the new provisions and how they will be used, in particular in relation to the impact of the Muirburn provisions on mitigating wildfires and on the extension of powers to Scottish SPCA officers. I therefore echo Emma Harper's earlier comments when she spoke to Amendment 76 that regular monitoring is essential to assess the bill's effectiveness. My Amendment 110 adds a statutory requirement to review and report on the operation and effectiveness of the provisions in the bill within five years of it receiving royal assent. It sets out that the re review must in particular consider the parts of the bill relating to glue traps, to snares, to Scottish SPCA inspectors and to Muirburn. It also sets out that Scottish ministers must prepare and publish a report of the review and lay that report before Parliament. I believe that this review would facilitate the Scottish Government's commitment to an open and transparent approach to legislation. And I also think that this review will help to allay some of the concerns that have been expressed by members of the Parliament today. And I would welcome the Minister's comments on this important amendment to review and report on the operation of the Bill. And, Presiding Officer, I move Amendment 110 in my name. Thank you. And I call Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this amendment also ensures that the SSPCA powers are reviewed, as I had tried to do in my previous amendment. We need to evaluate third sector organisations' involvement in detecting crime and gathering evidence. My concern is not about the SSPCA themselves. They do a wonderful job, but my concern is about the precedent it sets. So I welcome this amendment and hope that these powers will be reviewed. And I hope that review will make sure that other third sector organisations are not involved in crime detection or um, prosecution. Thank you. And I call the Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, this bill has been a long time in coming, and it introduces some fundamental changes to wildlife management and grouse moor practices. And I believe they are the right changes. But I think it's important that when new legislation is passed, the Scottish Government should continue to monitor the impact that it has to ensure that it is working in the way that it was intended. I therefore want to thank Eleanor Whittam for bringing forward this amendment, which I think is a very helpful addition to the Bill. And I hope that the requirement to undertake a review of the provision in the Bill will help to lay some of the concerns that have been raised about the effect of the new powers in this Bill and how, we, how they will be used. I would also like to point out right now, President Officer, that there is a video today of a man called Dee Ward up in Rotal Estate who does an amazing job on an upland estate while he manages to do commercial business at the same time as conserving wildlife, restoring peatland and doing all of the things that we want to do in this bill. And he is an exemplar of how that is being done and I hope that this bill is the start of so many other estates doing exactly the same thing. So I will therefore be voting for this amendment and I encourage all members to support it. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Eleanor Whittam to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 110. Thank you, Presiding Officer, um, and thank you to Rhoda Grant for her comments. And I'm pleased to hear that the Minister agrees with my reasons for bringing forward Amendment 110 and that he will support it. And I urge um, parliamentary colleagues to do the same. Um, and I will press my amendment. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 110 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 36 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 38. Minister to move. Move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
we are agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 12. Minister to move. Moved, President Officer. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Shona Robson. Sorry, Ms. Robson. Just... Uh, I wasn't able to connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Fulton McGregor. No, sir. It's same issue. I couldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. The result of the vote on amendment number 37 in the name of Eleanor Whittam is yes 85, no 28. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I would like to advise the Chamber that the result on amendment 82 was yes 30, no 80. There were no abstentions, not yes 30, no 79 and no abstentions. And as previously advised, the amendment was not agreed to. That ends consideration of amendments. There are no questions to be put as a result of today's business, so that concludes decision time, and I close this meeting.